the All right, I'm supposed to talk about uh, nonlinear dynamics and chaos, dynamic <coughs> systems, things of that kind. Um, I realize this is a school on statistical physics, so the topic I'm going to speak about is slightly off the main theme of what we're uh, learning here. But it's important, and uh, Abhishek and uh, Sanjeev very rightly pointed out that uh, dynamical systems is in fact the basis of uh, all time evolution, is the basis for everything, including statistical mechanics. So in that sense, uh, it's not entirely out of place. However, it's not clear whether uh, it's not a homogeneous background, as I can see, the background that uh, the participants have here. And therefore, I'd like to know first if uh, any of you has already had a course in nonlinear dynamics or dynamical systems at the MSc level or something like that. So a fair number of people will find the rest of these lectures rather boring. Um, but as a, as a sort of uh, revision of familiar stuff, and, uh, perhaps as an um, incentive for you to make additional remarks, this might still be useful. I'm reminded of this uh, incident that took place many, many years ago. Um, when I was a graduate student, um, a gentleman called Stephen Adler from Princeton, a very famous particle physicist of those days, gave a set of lectures on quantum field theory. And he started by saying, I'm not going to assume any background at all, except for a rather thorough knowledge of the two volumes of Yorkin and Drell and Bogolikov and Shelkov. <laughs> when everybody had the same reaction, he said, However, since some of you may have forgotten a little bit, let me start at the beginning. <laughs> and he went on, so I can't do better than that. Okay, so uh, let me keep this very elementary, and then as we go along, we'll learn it's a little more, less trivially. Um, I'm going to speak only about classical dynamics, not about quantum dynamics at all, in which you had other sets of lectures. And I'm going to speak on essentially nonlinear systems, although I'll point out that linear systems are the route to understanding nonlinear systems. It's like a zero order level. Now, the first question is, what's a dynamical system? And I'd like to start by saying that just about anything is a dynamical system. Anything that evolves in time is a dynamical system. The number of uh, dependent variables may be finite may be countably infinite, may be non-denumerably infinite, as in the case of a field. They're all dynamical systems. The values of these dependent variables, they may be integer valued, they may be real valued, they may be complex valued. You may have a multiplicity of non-denumerable infinities, like if you're looking at the evolution, time evolution of the electromagnetic fields under Maxwell's equations, you have a degree of freedom. You have three degrees of freedom in the electric field and three degrees of freedom in the magnetic field at every space-time point. So you have a set of six degrees of freedom at every space-time point. And this is a continuum. And such systems typically would obey partial differential equations. That too is a dynamical system. The system may be relativistic, non-relativistic, may be classical, may be quantum mechanical. So as you can see, it's a huge variety of systems that we have. Above all, systems could have completely deterministic dynamics with some prescribed rules, or there could be a mixture of some noise, some random noise, or uh, some stochastic variables also present in the dynamical system. So all these possibilities make for a huge variety of uh, diverse kinds of systems, and it's a little too general for us to tackle. So I'm going to restrict my attention to a very small subclass of dynamical systems and point out as we go along that that itself is very rich in structure and also gives us very valuable hints as to what can happen in more complicated situations. So for me, a dynamical system, and this would be the standard uh, definition, would be a set of variables which I'm going to label as x1, x2, up to xn, some finite set of variables. Let's take them to be real valued, 
you can look at more complicated cases later. Let's take them to be elements of some, let's call all these things some vector x, which is an element of some n dimensional space, let's say Euclidean space. I'm not going to be very mathematical. Dynamical systems is, in fact, a branch of mathematics as mathematicians understand it. And Springer for Love has this ambition of bringing out an encyclopedia of mathematics. And they have 80 volumes projected or something like that. And the first 15 or 13 volumes are all devoted to dynamical systems. So it's a very formal thing in the mathematical sense. And our task is not to get into that, but rather to extract some simple physical examples and look at what happens there. Now, uh, I'm going to make loose mathematical statements. If necessary, we'll make it more rigorous later on. So I mentioned that this Rn is uh, a Euclidean space. It's just uh, sets of n tuples of reals, order n tuples. But of course, a mathematician would say that till Rn is endowed with an appropriate metric, it's not Euclidean space. So that sort of nicety I'll stay away from. It's Euclidean space, as far as we're concerned. So this vector in the Euclidean space evolves as a function of time. And what the dynamical system is going to do is to prescribe a set of rules for this evolution. So x1 dot of t is some function of x1 to xn, and possibly t as well. There's no reason why the rule can't change as a function of time. And similarly, down the line, x n dot is some function so this is my dynamical system definition of a dynamical system the dot stands for the first derivative with respect to time and now you must immediately ask why first order differential equations why not second order third order etc let's dispose of that matter right away the point is that if I have an appropriate number of variables for any system, the belief is that the equations of motion will become first order differential equations. Like Newton's equations, where you write the mass times acceleration is the force, it's a second order differential equation, but of course you know that the number of pieces of initial data that you need to solve this equation uniquely is two, not one. You need the initial position and the initial momentum or initial velocity, so it's really two coupled first order differential equations. And the advantage of a first order differential equation is that this set of equations plus initial conditions, the set of initial conditions at time zero or any time, uh, prescribes for you uniquely the solution as you go along. Every equation you can think of, Hamilton's equations of motion, first order differential equations, Schrodinger equation for the state vector is the first order differential equation and so on. So you'll permit me to define my dynamical system as a set of first order couple differential equations of this kind. They are ordinary differential equations because this set of variables is discrete. The moment I have a continuum, like a field or a vibrating string, then of course I need a partial differential equation because the number of degrees of freedom becomes continuously infinite and they are much, much harder to analyze, especially the nonlinear ones. So we will stay away from that. We are not going to look at nonlinear partial differential equations at all. In the problem of turbulence, of course, that's precisely what we do have to look at. We have to look at the Navier-Stokes equation, which is a deceptively simple equation, just a quadratic nonlinearity, and all the complexities of the universe are already in that. So our system is going to be just first order couple differential equations for a discrete set of variables, for an n countable set of variables with specified initial conditions. And let's make uh, the notation a little sensible. So let me call the vector f, the components of fn, so that this set of equations reads x dot. So this is a vector valued function of all these variables and possibly time. This together with the initial condition specifies for me the dynamical system. So we will work with that. And the matter becomes non-trivial for two reasons. 
one, the number n can be fairly large when you have complications occurring. And two, there is non-autonomous behavior here. And the third and most important one is that this function f could be a nonlinear function of the axis. And that's what nonlinear dynamics deals with, the nonlinearity of this. A moment's thought will show you that except for the linear harmonic oscillator, everything else in life is nonlinear. Therefore, that's really what you have to deal with. Now, this business of t, this extra t sitting here, it means the system is non-autonomous. And if the t is missing, then the system is said to be autonomous. And what's the complication involved here? Well, the fact that the rule changes as time goes along implies that the trajectory in phase space of any representative point could have complications. It could intersect itself, it could do all kinds of crazy things. But at a formal level, a non-autonomous system, this implies non-autonomous. In principle, a non-autonomous system can be converted to an autonomous one, at least formally, by a very simple expedient, and that is to define xn plus 1 to be equal to t itself. Then of course this set of equations is augmented with one more equation which says xn plus 1 dot equal to 1. That's not a particularly difficult function, but it's a function of all these variables, a rather trivial one, and therefore if I replace this t by xn plus 1, it's evident that a non-autonomous system in n variables becomes an autonomous system in n plus 1 variables. And therefore, at least in principle, you don't have any extra complication here. In practice, it's another matter altogether. Because just to give you a simple example, if you had just one degree of freedom, if you had just a single x, x, let's call x1 x itself, then just in this variable, dynamics occurs in the phase space of x and x dot, and in the phase plane, there's not enough room for complications like chaos to occur. On the other hand, if I include this t, then there are three variables in this phase space, in this extended phase space, and in the space of x, x dot, and t, the trajectories can be extremely complicated, and in particular, chaos can occur. A very simple example is provided by the so-called Duffing oscillator, which I will talk about a little later, of course. And this system is essentially a non-linear oscillator with some complications put in. So we start with uh, a second-order differential equation for the harmonic oscillator. So it's x double dot plus some omega naught squared x equal to zero. This is, of course, a trivial equation to solve. On the other hand, if this equation has damping in it, then you put alpha x dot plus omega naught squared x equal to zero. This already becomes a little more complicated because the motion is no longer conservative. There's damping for some positive value of alpha. And you now put in a little nonlinearity into the problem and invert the potential at the origin. Then this becomes x double dot plus alpha x dot minus gamma x plus gamma x cubed equal to zero. That's the Duffing oscillator, where these constants are all positive constants. So this would correspond to the harmonic oscillator. This would correspond to the harmonic oscillator with damping. So things would damp when it come down. This thing here would correspond to damping present with the potential of this thing. Because this portion is the, clearly the derivative of some potential. And that's already complicated. This system is already complicated. But now if I start shaking this oscillator, then you have x double dot plus alpha x dot minus beta x plus gamma x cube equal to some a cos omega t, where a is the amplitude of the forcing and omega is the frequency of the forcing. This is a forced nonlinear forced duffing oscillator. And whole books have been written on it. On this book. Yes. Yeah. 
That's right. Uh, it's not chaotic. This is not chaotic. At this level, it's not chaotic. Uh, I'll come and point out why. There's a criterion called the Mendelssohn criterion, he says. But in crude terms, I could explain why immediately. That has to do with the fact the phase trajectories to which I'm coming cannot intersect themselves in a plane. So for chaos to occur, you must have very complex trajectories. And these things cannot intersect. At best, they can go around in circles or close orbits. Or they go and hit some fixed point somewhere they spiral around it, but they can't tangle up really. Uh, there's not enough room in a plane. But the moment you have a third dimension, then like a ball of wool, it can do complicated things. So roughly that's what happens. Yeah? Sorry. Yeah. The T dependence here could be very complicated, no problem. However, the moment I define an Xn plus 1 to be equal to T identically, its time derivative is trivial, and that horribly nonlinear function of T becomes a function of Xn plus 1. So it just adds to the nonlinearity. So in principle, an autonomous N variable system, I won't call it degree of freedom because that's a good point. In Hamiltonian mechanics, the coordinates are the degrees of freedom and the momenta are the conjugate variables. So let me just say n variables, dynamical variables. In principle, all you've done is to increase it by 1. But in practice, increasing the dimensionality of a dynamical system by 1 can increase the complexity and all this. And that's what I'm pointing out here. You have x and x dot, the phase space is x and x dot. But the moment you are forcing, it's no longer an autonomous system because now you're applying or removing energy from the system. And this now makes it non-autonomous and you have to look, work in the extended phase space and things can be very complicated. In fact, there's one, two, three, and a fourth and a fifth parameter here. So the parameter space is extremely rich. But you could say, huh, let's choose my unit of time in a suitable way and let's put this quantity beta equal to one or alpha equal to one or something. Put the unforced frequency, the, the free, the linear part equal to 1. But you still have a four parameter space. And the richness of the solution space in this four parameter space is enormous. I don't think it's explored fully. I don't think it can be explored so, so fully, so trivially, because there are very many complications that can occur. Um, as many of you might know, this is a kind of equation leads to the so-called Matthew equation and then there are uh, tons of stability and there's all kinds of very messy complications that are there. But up to this level, some understanding is possible. In fact, this equation itself can be solved explicitly in terms of elliptic functions. So at this stage, adding this nonlinearity has not done very much. But the moment you do this, you're in a different game altogether. So this was just to show you how the addition of a little bit of forcing or non-autonomous component to the system can make it extremely complicated and intricate. And typically that's what one has to be. Now let's come back here to autonomous systems. So yeah. you let me proceed with autonomous systems simply because I say that you can add a variable to it. So we'll analyze henceforth systems which are autonomous, which mean that the equation is of this kind. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. They won't. Yeah, in the extended phase space, they won't. But in the original phase space, they won't. So the statement is, that's the argument made, is that in a system like this, the idea is, the assumption is, that this function f is sufficiently smooth. For operational reasons, we could take it that all the partial derivatives exist, with respect to all the x components. Then, this, together with the initial condition, plus some initial condition x of 0, implies a unique solution. This means immediately that the phase trajectories in the space of these x's would be curves of this kind in continuous time, since I'm looking at dynamics in continuous time. I ought to have mentioned in the beginning that time itself could be discrete value. 
and we are going to look at such systems. They are maps, we look at them, and they have their own complications. And there are many, many problems where time is a discrete variable, um, essentially a discrete variable, such as population dynamics, where the generation number will count the time, if you like, or, uh, well, commodity prices, if you look at them every day or every week or something like that, the time is discrete and in between you don't care what happens. But for the moment, we look at continuous time dynamics. So given an initial condition of this kind, the system moves along the phase trajectory. And now my claim is that you can never have a scenario like this. Because if you did, then this point could be taken as the initial condition, and then from there, two futures emanate. And that's not possible. So phase trajectories for autonomous systems can't intersect themselves. They can't intersect each other. That simplifies matters a little bit, not too much. Well, I don't know. It simplifies things, but it still doesn't help too much. If the dimensionality is large, then it doesn't do very much. There's only one exception to the rule, and that is, you could have a phase trajectory emanating out of this point, and it could come back and intersect itself in this fashion. And then, of course, you have periodic motion, because all the variables have returned to their initial values, and after a finite amount of time, they keep coming back, and therefore, you have periodicity in the system. That is the simplest example of that, periodicity. And we'll see that periodicity is an exception rather than the rule. Very exceptional. And in fact, finding all the periodic solutions of a nonlinear system is not the, is, the, the solution is not, there's no general algorithm to do this. Especially if, as happens very often, you have an isolated periodic orbit. Only for some special initial condition or set of initial conditions, you're going to be on a periodic orbit, but if you're not, if you're a little bit away from that initial condition, you flow off, and if a little bit away, you flow in into some fixed point, then such isolated periodic orbits, they call limit cycles, are very hard to find. There's no algorithm in general to find or classify all the limit cycles except in the simplest instances. So already you see the complications. Sir, that's Yes, absolutely. So, in a non-autonomous system, that's perfectly allowed because when you come back to that point, you have a different rule of evolution. And therefore, it moves along a different curve. So, for a non-autonomous system, certainly trajectories can cross themselves. Except they can't do so in extended phase space. Because then, if you include the T as well, then things become unique. So now, uh, once we have this, once we have this idea that uh, we have a set of differential equations, there are unique solutions, closed orbits would mean periodic uh, motion, other orbits could be all kinds of things, complicated things, etc. Then the next question is, how do we go about solving this set of equations in general? And now I put it to you that a uh, very important basic concept here is the difference between solvability and integrability. They're very different things altogether. Integrability, as I'll define it, will imply solvability, but solvability doesn't say anything. So it doesn't imply integrability at all. And it's none as follows. Well, in principle, it's triviality itself. Because you have this equation, x naught is f of x, and now I would like to find out, given an initial point x0, what does x do in the vicinity of this x0? So here's my x0 in phase space. And what's the solution? A little delta t away from this equation, from this uh, point. Then it's clear that x at time delta t equal to, well, I write dx over dt and multiply q, etc. So it's equal to f of x0 this point, plus So it's solved. The equation is solved. That's the solution. In other words, given this point, a little delta t away, I can do what delta t is. 
and then a little delta t away I give you what the value is, etc. And therefore I construct the phase trajectory by doing this. I call this solvability. If f x of f of x naught is zero, then I cannot proceed. I don't know what to do. This is not going to work if f of x naught is zero. But in general, generically it's not, except for a set of isolated points. And then assuming that f of x naught is zero, so yes, very good point. This vector field doesn't vanish. So this is a vector field here, this thing here. And wherever it vanishes, you have a singularity. Then I have a fixed point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. So this point is that this solution is valid only if f of x naught is not zero. But if it's zero, then I have to do it all over again. Then this is not true any longer. I have a critical point, and we're going to analyze critical. So I'm just pointing out that generically, typically, the <coughs> solution to this equation, f of x equal to 0, the solution to an equation of this kind, it's a set of algebraic equations, is a set of isolated points. If these functions f are nice, smooth functions, etc., they will not have a continuous set of zeros. It's a set of isolated points, and therefore, I'm going to look at that generic case where the isolated roots of this equation are the critical points of the flow, and I will analyze them separately. But otherwise, the system is solvable. Yeah. yeah, you give me an x0, and I will tell you any typical x0, I pick any initial condition, which doesn't happen to sit on top of a critical point, and then I can do this. And I can find in this neighborhood, I can find what the trajectory. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, I start with an initial condition, and I look at the set of the equations, and I solve it. After all, this is what you do on a computer. You discretize time, and then you find out what it does, a little delta t data, etc. Keep doing this till the system, till you have a continuous curve. You ex interpolate between the, take the time step to be smaller and smaller, and then you get a continuous curve. This is solvable. It does not help me to say what's going to be the long time behavior of this initial condition. So if I start with an initial condition here, it will tell me what's going on here in this fashion. But it won't tell me what is going to happen very far, very, very in the, in the distant future. Because I may have to repeat this an arbitrarily large number of times to reach some finite point. The intervals in which this will be valid may get smaller and smaller. So I could have a problem of that kind. So is this No, it's nothing to do with Markov or anything like that. So I'm not even looking at stochastic processes at the moment. It's completely deterministic. I have a set of first order differential equations. Now, they're nonlinear. What would you do to solve them on a computer? Choose an initial condition, keep a sufficiently small time step, and say what it does after time step delta t. Then start that with that as the initial condition and repeat the procedure. So you implies that you have, can have the initial condition. Pardon me? Solvability only implies that you can have a set of initial conditions. Generically, I have initial conditions. Right? You give me the initial conditions. In any system, I choose whatever initial condition I would like. Right? I want to explore all of phase space, so I choose an initial condition near the region I'd like to explore, and I want to find out what the trajectory is there. So, what kind of system will not be solvable? Will there be anything? No. By this definition, no. Everything is solvable. Yeah, everything is solvable. By this definition, generically, everything is solvable, except it doesn't help very much to solve the problem. The solvability. <laughs> if I can integrate, that's different. But I can't solve, and that's the distinction I want to impress very forcefully. Solvability doesn't imply integrity for the following reason. The mathematicians have a nice name for this simple procedure, and that's called the rectification theorem for vector fields. So what they will tell you is the following. I uh, over the years I've gotten into the habit of taking little things at mathematicians. So let me start by saying that some of my best friends are mathematicians. As the saying goes, 
and they're very clever people, except that sometimes their language is impenetrable to the rest of us. <laughs> Otherwise, they do very clever things. So what they've done is formalize.